Hi guys, it's your science teacher here with another video. This time it's all about organisation in animals and plants. The start of B4 organisation in animals and plants looks at how multicellular organisms uh, in animals uh, transport substances around their body and um, the blood is a key part of how uh, we transport substances around our bodies and blood is more complex than it first uh, looks. For example, look at this microscope's image of blood um, and you can see some of the key components in the blood uh, from this picture. Uh, these donut shaped cells are perhaps what you're most familiar about when we look at blood and these are red blood cells. However, red blood cells um, don't make up as large a percentage of the blood as you may think. They actually only account for 40 uh, to 45 percent of blood. So what actually makes up the rest of our blood? Well, um, you can see this funny shape here uh, in the blood and uh, this makes up a tiny component of our blood but it's very important. Uh, these are called platelets okay uh, and platelets are what causes uh, blood to clot. Um, say for example uh, you uh, cut your arm you don't want to bleed out to death you need something to stop uh, your wound from uh, just keeping on spilling out and that's what platelets do they clot the blood they run to the source of a wound and will cause the blood to clot. Now you know the job of the red blood cells is to carry oxygen um, around the body. But there's also uh, some other key things in your blood. The platelets only account for about 1% uh, to 2% of blood. They, they don't need to have that much of it in the blood. Uh, the vast majority of blood is actually uh, plasma. And if you look, there's lots of spacing and gaps between the red blood cells. That's because they're carried around in a substance called plasma. And this accounts for around 50% of all of the blood. And the role of the plasma is to transport uh, the red blood cells um, and also uh, to get rid of all the substances that you do not want in the blood. For example, it carries uh, CO2 away and also it carries urea in it as well things that other cells want carrying out of them it, it will tri it will form in the plasma it will get, get transported out of your body through the plasma now there is also another thing in uh, uh, blood and i don't think you can see it very clearly in this diagram but the other uh, component on the blood is white blood cells and this only accounts for about uh, one percent of the blood and obviously you know what white blood cells do they fight infections so now we know what blood's comprised of we need to look about how it moves around the body and there are three main vessels it travels around we have the artery we have the capillary and we have the vein and they are perfectly adapted for carrying the blood in the way uh, that needs to be done. The artery takes blood away from the heart and I always kind of remember it artery away and vein because it finishes with in, vein, in. So this one takes it in to the heart. Um, and the capillaries are kind of what connects the arteries and the veins together and a lot of the diffusion happens in the capillaries where you need to get oxygen into your blood and uh, you need to get carbon dioxide out and that happens through the uh, capillaries and uh, around the alveoli and the lungs and we'll start to talk about that in a bit. Um, so I said that they were adapted perfectly for their jobs. Let's have a look at them a bit more in detail then. If we look at an artery, for example, these are the thickest of all the blood vessels, okay? And the reason why they are so thick is because of the fact that blood is at really high pressures in the arteries. Um, that's because of the fact it's been uh, pushed by the heart uh, and it's traveling really, really quickly, so it's at high pressure. Um, you want that artery to be thick so that it doesn't puncture and it doesn't 
uh, cave into the pressure of the blood traveling through it. Now looking at a vein, uh, veins aren't as thick as arteries and they contain these things called valves. This is their main adaptation. They contain valves and the reason for, the, for them to contain in valves is to stop the backflow of blood. That's because the pressure in the veins of the blood uh, is not as high as it is in arteries. So the blood can actually flow backwards if there's not valves. And that would be incredibly bad. So uh, there's valves in there to stop the backflow. And capillaries there are adapted by being incredibly thin. Um, and uh, that means that uh, things can diffuse in and out. Uh, diffusion is easy through uh, the capillaries. In humans, we have what's called a double circularity system. This means that blood enters the heart twice, okay? It goes uh, through the heart and then goes to the lungs where it becomes oxygenated and then goes back to the heart to be pumped around the body. And now we're going to look at the heart and see how our heart supports this uh, double circularity system. So the heart plays a rather massive role in the double circularity system as it uh, takes the blood and sends it to the lungs to become oxygenated and then takes it back to send it round the body. Uh, now the blood enters the heart through the vein here called the vena cava um, and it enters and goes into the right atrium here. There is a valve here that stops the backflow of blood uh, and opens to allow it through, when needed, into the right ventricle. Once it's gone into the right ventricle, it needs to send the blood to the lungs in order to become oxygenated. After the blood's been in the right ventricle, it needs to go to the lungs. And another word relating to lungs is pulmonary. And remember, because the blood's going uh, away from the heart, it's going to be the pulmonary artery which takes blood away and to the lungs. So that's the pulmonary artery. Now, coming back from the lungs, uh, because now it's oxygenated, the blood needs to go back to the heart before being pumped around the body again, it comes back in both directions through these four holes and these four holes are known as the pulmonary because it's relating to the lungs it's come from the lungs and because it's not an artery it's going into the heart it's known as the pulmonary vein okay and then remember it's going to go exactly like uh, in the last time it's going to go into now the left atrium with the valve to stop the backflow of blood and then it's going to go into the left ventricle before being pumped around the body through this kind of three pronged uh, uh, aorta it's called uh, which is a, a massive artery okay which splits into three so it can take blood all around the body now, if you were to actually look at a human heart, the left side of the heart is actually thicker. And the reason for the left heart being thicker is because uh, it's having to pump the blood uh, further around the body. That has to go all the way around your body, the blood from the heart. Whereas uh, if it's going from the right side, all it's doing is going to the lungs and back. So it doesn't need as much energy. That's why there's more muscle and it's thicker round the left hand side of your heart. Your heart will be over approximately 2 billion times in your lifetime. So that's a lot of strain put on your heart and your heart muscles and the valves inside your heart. That's why sometimes you can get faults, okay? And we're going to look at a couple of ways that science is trying to combat them faults uh, using technology. Inside your right atrium, there's a group of cells which control your heartbeat and tell your heart when to pump and when to not pump. As time goes on, these cells become really worn out and sometimes your heartbeat can become irregular. And that's why some people get an artificial pacemaker uh, um, added to them. Um, so what an artificial pacemaker does is it sends electrical impulses uh, to your heart and to your atrium uh, and it basically makes the heart pulse. 
Now, pacemakers have been installed uh, in thousands and millions of people now because they are relatively safe, okay? It's a relatively safe procedure to carry out. And also the fact uh, we, we've got the technology that, that it's now quite cheap to do as well. Now, when pacemakers are installed, they're usually installed just uh, below your shoulder. So it stays quite a way away from your heart. So it's quite an easy procedure to carry out. Uh, and it's not too difficult. However, sometimes pacemakers are not enough uh, to keep someone's heart healthy. And if a heart has completely given up, uh, what's sometimes uh, installed is an artificial heart. And uh, these are not that common. Uh, there's only been around 5,000, 6,000 of them installed into people. And um, it's a very dangerous procedure. It's almost last chance. Um, and usually people are only given artificial hearts whilst they are on uh, a waiting list for maybe a donor heart uh, that will match them. Now, artificial hearts can do exactly the same as a normal heart. So sometimes they're actually used to just give a diseased heart a rest for a while before that's reinstalled back into the person once it's recovered. Um, so there is a lot of research going on to, into how to make these artificial hearts uh, even better and to reduce their blood clots coming from the artificial hearts. Animals aren't the only ones to have complex uh, organ system. Plants also have organ systems as well. And we're going to specifically focus on the organ in the plant, uh, the leaf. Um, because you've looked at specialised cells, you know how root cells work. Um, but we're going to just focus on the leaf. And the leaf is comprised of uh, many tissues, which we're going to talk about. The first one is the waxy cuticle, and that's on the upper side of the leaf, and that protects uh, the leaf from damage, and it stops water from leaving uh, through transpir transpiration. It's often quite waxy to stop water leaving. The layer below it, the upper epidermis layer, is very similar in the fact it's, it prevents water loss as well. Um, and it gives that leaf a bit of stability as well. Um, the next layer we're going to look at is perhaps one of the most interesting layers in the plant. This is the palisade mesophyll layer. And this is where uh, most of the photosynthesis takes place. And it's perfectly adapted for that job uh, because of the fact uh, there is lots and lots of chloroplast. Uh, remember, chloroplast is where um, photosynthesis occurs. Uh, chloroplast contains uh, chlorophyll, which absorbs sun en the sun's energy and it helps to convert that water and carbon dioxide into glucose and oxygen. Notice how the next layer is, a, is known as a spongy mesophyll and it has lots of air gaps uh, in between as well. And these air gaps are important. They allow gases to diffuse in and out of the cells. Uh, think about it. Those cells need carbon dioxide um, to uh, photosynthesize and they also need to get, ox get rid of the oxygen that they produce. As oxygen is a waste product for uh, the leaf. And if you look at the bottom of uh, the leaf, you look at the underside, this, this stoma and the guard cells. Well, what the guard cells do is they open and close. And the stoma are the gaps uh, which allow the gases to leave uh, or enter. Think about it. It needs to get uh, carbon dioxide into the plant and let oxygen leave. Now you might see that there's also uh, two other bits that I haven't talked about in my leaf, two other tissues, let's say, uh, and they're the xylem and the phloem. And I talked about this uh, in my previous video in B1, Cell Structure and Transport. We looked at the xylem and the phloem. The xylem transports water and minerals up from the roots. Um, and uh, the phloem, what it does is it transports uh, the products from photosynthesis uh, back down, okay? Uh, and it can also transport some minerals up. Phloem can go both ways. Uh, it, can, it actually has valves so that it can control um, which way things go and which ways 
which way going from the roots or going down from the leaf. So it's safe to say that the leaf is very complex and we need to know quite a lot about the leaf, uh, which is an organ in itself. Now, as much as a plant would uh, like to keep all of its water, unfortunately it can't, okay? Uh, when uh, factors uh, that affect water loss, uh, you've got wind, uh, you've got heat, uh, and these can cause plants uh, to lose uh, some of the water that they've got. Now, plants um, have come up with some ingenious adaptations uh, in order to slow water loss down. Think about cactuses, for example. Um, cacti, for example. Uh, they um, have very few leaves uh, because that's where they lose lots of their water. Um, also, they are very waxy um, so that uh, water doesn't uh, come to the surface very often. Also, uh, think about uh, when stomata open and close. Stomata, if you were to do an investigation, stomata often only um, open during the hours of photosynthesis. They will close uh, when they're not photosynthesizing so that to reduce the amount of water uh, they lose. Now you can measure the amount of transpiration uh, and the water loss of a plant and you can use a potometer and what you could do is you could set up the equipment like this with a plant here and the plant's going to take up uh, some of the water through its roots uh, down here uh, and it, what will happen is this air bubble will move up. This is kind of like a reservoir of water that it can keep replacing itself with. Um, so that's not going to affect the experiment. Um, so the, the air bubble will move each time the plant takes up more water. We've now come to the end of the topic. Um, well done for watching all the way through to the end. You will really benefit. Keep working really, really hard. Uh, remember, if you liked the video, please uh, will you subscribe to my channel.